Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Solar, Solar Project. Project. And this is my dad, Craig Wolf. This is my daughter, Angela Summers. And you may also hear some background noise from my granddaughter, her daughter, Joanna. She's down here on the floor. <laughs> so time is running out on our window of opportunity to respond to the climate emergency. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has introduced a resolution to Congress, and it's called the Green New Deal. That outlines immediate actions needed to turn around our climate emergency. In a few seconds, we will hear an in-depth analysis of the Green New Deal by Winston Apple, longtime environmental activist and former candidate for the U.S. Congress from Missouri. And we'll be right back with Winston Apple. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Those opening lines from Charles Dickens' classic novel, A Tale of Two Cities, serve quite well to describe the situation we find ourselves in at present. The hope that flowed from the ideals of the Enlightenment embedded within our founding documents has been tempered by our failure to live up to those ideals. The ease of modern life that is the result of technological miracles made possible by the scientific revolution has been offset by our failure to reckon with the harmful externalities that have also come from scientific advances and with the rejection of science by so many people with regard to the climate crisis. We find ourselves in a situation we might call a tale of two futures. Not so much a book as a script for a reality show we will star in together over the next few years and decades, and that our children and grandchildren will find themselves in for better or worse as this century plays out. Given the fact that we have not turned the corner on adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, given the fact that there is no reason to believe the mass of people are going to change their ways anytime soon, and given the fact that there is only a slim hope that we will elect a government anytime soon that will effectively address the uh, climate crisis and uh, the need to reverse global warming. The consequences suffered by humanity as a result of our collective past, present, and future contributions to global warming are nearly certain to make times worse and worse for a great many people in at least the near future. The nature of those consequences is already evident to anyone who is paying attention. The choices we make individually but especially collectively and the actions we take or fail to take individually, but especially collectively, over the next few years and decades will determine just how bad things get and how quickly they get that bad. And determine most importantly, whether we reach a turning point where we begin to reverse global warming before we pass tipping points that cause climate change to spin out of our control. The sooner wisdom begins to outpace foolishness, the better. The sooner belief surpasses incredulity, the better. The sooner light eclipses darkness, the better. The sooner the winter of despair gives way to a spring of hope, 
the better. We have it in our power to reclaim paradise and create a heaven on earth. The longer most members of the human race simply go about their business as usual, the longer our government is controlled by deniers, the more likely we are to find ourselves in a living hell on earth. At least the hint of a spring of hope came a few months ago when Cortez the Conqueror, newly elected Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, came striding onto the field of battle. Shunning the reticence expected of first-time members of Congress, she joined members of the Sunrise Movement who were camped out in Speaker Pelosi's office in January, and joining forces with an elderly white male senator, Ed Markey of Massachusetts, she introduced the Green New Deal resolution the first week of February. In the questionable tradition of politics as practiced in the United States, that resolution has been discussed by a great many people and read by but a few. After an initial burst of attention, both positive and negative, the issue seems to have faded a bit already, at least for now. The winter of despair maintains its icy grip with regard to the climate crisis. A vote in the Senate served to put the resolution on ice. With one Democrat voting no on the Green New Deal resolution and all the other Democratic senators voting present to avoid having their support for a proper response to the climate crisis used against them in next year's election. The Democratic Speaker of the House referred to the Green New Deal as the Green Dream or whatever. We should not expect the House to pass the resolution anytime soon. We may be in for a few more years of the winter of despair. And yet someday soon, as the consequences of our collective actions continue to increase in magnitude and frequency, there will be renewed and continued discussion of this critical issue. It is not going away. Things are going to get worse. And when we return to the issue, the discussion will go back to the issues raised in the Green New Deal resolution because it addresses the heart of the matter. It is focused on what our government must do for its part in responding appropriately to the climate crisis. So let's take a look at the Green New Deal resolution. The Chinese symbol for crisis is a combination of two other symbols, for danger and for opportunity. The resolution opens with the dangers we are facing and then catalogs the opportunities it presents for making the world a better place as we save or attempt to save the human race. There is a lot to like about the Green New Deal resolution. It lays out a fairly comprehensive and accurate overview of what we need to do in response to the climate crisis. It references Franklin Roosevelt's Economic Bill of Rights, the current Democratic Party platform, and the social justice aims of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It also incorporates and accentuates the need for inclusion of frontline and vulnerable communities, as well as the need for local input and control. A relatively minor problem, given the fact that very few people will ever read the resolution itself, is that it is not particularly well written it would benefit from the services of a good editor. The entire resolution reads like it was written by a committee. It probably was. It's good to be inclusive, but the document itself does not need to read that way. It's also unnecessarily repetitive. Certain phrases and goals are repeated several times. Goals and actions get interspersed here and there, and the case for the actions called for could be made more powerfully and convincingly. The broad and inclusive nature of the resolution has limited support because some members of Congress who might support a jobs program are not supportive of other aspects of the proposal. A more serious problem is that the dangers we are facing as a result of the climate crisis 
are significantly understated. The reports on the climate crisis that were released in October and November of 2018 got more media attention than previous reports. Those reports are referenced in the preamble to the Green New Deal resolution with a list of the effects we are already seeing. A changing climate is causing sea levels to rise and an increase in wildfires, severe storms, droughts, and other extreme weather events. There are predictions based on warming reaching or surpassing two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Mass migration from the regions most affected by climate change, more extensive wildfires, a loss of more than 99% of all coral reefs on Earth, estimated losses of economic output and damage to public infrastructure and coastal real estate. The predictions of the financial cost of inaction in terms of lost productivity and property damage make the case that the financial cost of passing the Green New Deal will be less than the cost of not passing it. That is true and it is an important point. But the impacts described in those reports and in the resolution are far from the worst possible impacts of the climate crisis. They fail to take into account the full cost in terms of lost and wasted lives. Admittedly, putting an objective price on human life is impossible. But it is the price we will pay in terms of loss and wasted lives that is far and away the real price we will pay for our continuing failure to respond appropriately to the climate crisis. And just how many lives are lost and wasted will be determined by how soon and how dramatically we change our ways and by how many of us make the necessary changes. The reports referenced say that to avoid the most severe impacts of climate change, we need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 60 percent from 2010 levels by 2030, and we need to reach net zero emissions by 2050. The reports and the resolution say we must keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, but we are currently on pace to see three degrees to six degrees of warming by the end of this century. And we can really only speculate with regard to what our world will look like if we see increases of that amount. We are heading into uncharted territory. There is a wide range of opinions within the scientific community and among the community of activists who are concerned with the climate crisis regarding how bad things will get and how quickly they will get that bad. There are a couple of unknown factors that make predictions difficult. Scientists do not yet know how long carbon dioxide lingers in the atmosphere, and nobody knows how soon we will elect a Congress that will actually do what needs to be done politically, or how soon the general public's level of concern will rise to the point where a significant percentage of people change their habits as needed. The absolute worst case scenario is that we have already delayed action too long and the human race is going extinct no matter what we do. A more common assessment describes common ch uh, climate change as an existential threat and posits that we must act boldly and soon to avoid making our planet uninhabitable. Both of these terms, an existential threat and a planet that is uninhabitable, imply the possibility of extinction, but do so in a manner that slips by most people without really registering. The most common assessment of our situation is that we are so late in responding to the threat posed by the climate crisis that we must act boldly and soon to avoid reaching a tipping point where further warming is locked in even if we change our ways and where each succeeding generation is doomed to a more and more horrific future for some time to come. Awareness regarding the serious nature of the threat posed by the climate crisis is growing because extreme weather events are becoming more common. Media cannot help but cover extreme weather events. They are newsworthy. 
The property damage and loss of human life demand coverage. Dramatic images of hurricanes, wildfires, massive flooding, and huge snowfalls, combined with stories of the tragic impact on individuals and families, and images of rescues and other heroic efforts by first responders make for good television. Unfortunately, there is one important exception among the consequences. The deadliest threat posed by the climate crisis, extreme drought, does not make for good television. Droughts unfold slowly. They are in some ways a non-event. Day after day, the rains simply do not come. As the days without rain turn to weeks, months, and years, crops fail. Farmers and ranchers lose their livelihood and are forced off the land. They become climate refugees. At some point, famine ensues and conflicts break out over who will get the food that is produced, including any humanitarian aid that is sent to relieve the suffering. People die. Pe poor people in faraway countries. Sea levels rising, wildfires, hurricanes, and flooding do a lot of property damage and lead to some loss of human lives. They are devastating to the people directly involved. But droughts and the conflicts they ignite are far and away the biggest contributor to the loss of human life and to the human flood of refugees as people are driven from their homes. Long-lasting extreme droughts are predicted to cover more and more of the surface of the earth with each passing decade this century. This is based on a simple scientific fact. Warmer air holds more water vapor and holds it longer. As global temperatures continue to increase, extreme droughts will become more common, and when, when rain does come, it will be more likely to come as torrential downpours and flooding, which further reduce food production. Instead of the more recent reports from last year, I wish the Green New Deal resolution had referenced a study done for the Department of Defense in 2003. An abrupt climate change scenario and its implications for United States national security. The authors of that study emphasized that the consequences of widespread shortages of food and water resulting from extreme droughts covering more and more of the surface of our planet are what is likely to trigger the most consequential aspects of the threat posed to humanity by the climate crisis. Millions, if not billions, of deaths from starvation. Additional millions or billions of deaths from wars and conflicts within and between nations, including nuclear armed nations, and mass migrations involving additional millions or billions of climate refugees. That report warns of the probability of failed states and closes by saying that civilization, quote, could collapse if carrying capacities everywhere were suddenly lowered drastically by abrupt climate change, humanity would revert to its norm of constant battles for diminishing resources. Once again, warfare would define human life, unquote. It's a very sobering and insightful guide for purposes of understanding how bad things could get fairly soon. And it is not the future I want for my children or grandchildren or yours. That report also points out that the steadily worsening effects of continual increases in global warming may lead to tipping points along the way that cause more abrupt changes. Major impacts could come at any time, and we don't know how long the negative effects will linger. Rather than think in terms of reducing emissions by X percent by a fixed date, we need to realize that we must, must act sooner or later and that sooner is much, much better than later, and that we must act boldly, the more boldly, the better. We are playing Russian roulette with the future of the human race, and we are running out of empty chambers. With that cheerful thought in mind, let's look on the bright side. 
There has been some talk of breaking out the individual pieces of legislation called for in the Green New Deal resolution. When you search the document for purposes of doing that, you find that the heart and soul of a Green New Deal is the idea of putting people to work on the jobs that need to be done in order to minimize the consequences of the climate crisis. That is a fairly simple proposal that will become more compelling as time goes by and the price of inaction becomes more and more obvious. The final whereas in the preamble of the Green New Deal resolution references World War II and New Deal job programs during the Great Depression and points out that as a result of the climate crisis, we have, quote, a historic opportunity to create millions of good high wage jobs and to provide unprecedented levels of prosperity and economic security for all people of the United States. At one point, the language in the resolution includes a job guarantee. A tale of two futures. Anyone who is familiar with Fr President Franklin Roosevelt's Economic Bill of Rights and with the current Democratic Party platform will be struck by the strong correlations between the Green New Deal resolution and those other documents. January 11th of this year was the 75th anniversary of President Roosevelt's 1944 State of the Union Address which included his call for an Economic Bill of Rights. A job guarantee was the first right listed. This is what FDR said. We have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not free men. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. In our day, these economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. We have accepted, so to speak, a second Bill of Rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station, race, or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job in the industries or shops or farms or mines of the nation the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment, the right to a good education. This is language taken from the current Democratic Party platform. All of these are quotes. We are committed to doing everything we can to build a full employment economy where everyone has a job that pays enough to raise a family and live in dignity with a sense of purpose. Democrats reject the notion that we have to choose between protecting our planet and creating good paying jobs. We can and we will do both. To create good paying middle class jobs that cannot be outsourced, Democrats support high labor standards in clean energy infrastructure and the right to form or join a union, whether in renewable power or advanced vehicle manufacturing. Democrats will expand Social Security so that every American can retire with dignity and respect. Democrats have been fighting to secure universal health care for the American people for generations. Democrats believe that health care is a right, not a privilege, and our health care system should put people before profits. Democrats will increase funding to support the next generation of farmers and ranchers, with particular attention given to promoting environmentally sustainable agricultural practices. 
We will encourage programs to protect and enhance family farms, a cherished way of life for millions of Americans. This is language taken directly from the Green New Deal resolution. Listen for the echoes. A Green New Deal will require guaranteeing a job with a family sustaining wage, adequate family and medical leave, paid vacations, and retirement security to all people of the United States. Strengthening and protecting the right of all workers to organize, unionize, and collectively bargain. Supporting family farming by investing in sustainable farming and land use practices. Ensuring a commercial environment where every business person is free from unfair competition and domination by domestic or international monopolies and providing all people of the United States with high quality health care, affordable, safe and adequate housing, economic security and access to clean water, clean air, healthy and affordable food and nature. The bottom line is that if we are to avoid the worst consequences of global warming, there is a lot of work to be done. Manufacturing and installing wind turbines and solar panels, manufacturing zero emission vehicles, updating, improving, and expanding mass transit systems, constructing high-speed rail, including maglev and vac train systems, improving the energy efficiency of existing homes and businesses. Some alleged friends of the Green New Deal seem to be attempting to kill it with kindness by describing it as aspirational. The proposals included in the resolution might have been aspirational 75 years ago, when FDR first proposed an economic bill of rights. They might even have been aspirational 50 years ago, when President Johnson declared a war on poverty. We can no longer afford for them to be aspirational. A bill that would have provided a federal job guarantee was introduced in Congress in 1945, but the job guarantee was taken out before it passed in 1946. It's time to pass a true Full Employment Act with a federal job guarantee. A federal job guarantee would lead in short order to victory in the war on poverty. The phrase working poor would become the oxymoron it should be. We would end at last at least one modern form of slavery, freeing wage slaves who labor for a wholly inadequate minimum wage. Including health care in a Green New Deal could be seen as extraneous, but it's still the right thing to do. The American people do not need Democrats to continue fighting for universal health care. They need us to win that fight now. Universal access to health care may have been aspirational several generations ago. It must be more than that now. Another point that needs to be made is an obvious one. The Green New Deal resolution is a resolution. It doesn't do anything except say what we agree needs to be done, and obviously not everyone in Congress agrees on what needs to be done. Republicans are famous for their denial of this crisis. The Republican Party platform states that, and I quote, the environment is too important to be left to radical environmentalists. Their approach is based on shoddy science, scare tactics, and centralized command and control regulation. Goes on to say, climate change is far from this nation's most pressing national security issue. This is the triumph of extremism over common sense, and Congress must stop it. And stop it, Congress has. Congress has done a very thorough job of stopping the federal government from responding appropriately to the threat posed by the climate crisis. And while Republicans may deserve most of the blame for that, they have had help from some Democratic members of Congress. Republicans in Congress are strongly united on major legislation favored by their corporate and plutocratic benefactors. They came within one vote of repealing the Affordable Care Act 
without any replacement in sight. Polls showed about 25% of the electorate favored that legislation. They passed a massive tax cut, skewed heavily in favor of corporations and billionaires with a few votes to spare. That bill had 28% support in the polls. Democrats in Congress have not been that united in support of any of the major pieces of legislation called for in the party platform, despite the fact that polls show 60% and above approval for all of it, including the Green New Deal. This is just some of what the Democratic Party platform has to say about the climate crisis. All quotes. We believe America must be running entirely on clean energy by mid-century. We cannot leave our children a planet that has been profoundly damaged. Democrats believe that climate change poses a real and urgent threat to our economy, our national security, and our children's health and futures, and that Americans deserve the jobs and security that come from becoming the clean energy superpower of the 21st century. We are committed to a national mobilization and to leading a global effort to mobilize nations to address this threat on a scale not seen since World War II. We will not only meet the goals we set in Paris, we will seek to exceed them and push other countries to do the same by slashing carbon pollution and rapidly driving down emissions of greenhouse gases like hydrofluorocarbons. Climate change is an urgent threat and a defining challenge of our time. Given the nature of these statements drawn from the party platform, you might assume that Democrats are strongly united in support of the Green New Deal resolution. You would be wrong. There are 235 Democrats in the House of Representatives at this time. As of yesterday, 91 of them have signed on as co-sponsors of the Green New Deal resolution, joining sponsor Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. 143 have not. There are 45 Democrats and two independents who caucus with the Democrats in the Senate. Ed Markey is the sponsor, and 11 Democrats and one very popular independent have signed on as co-sponsors of the Senate version of the resolution. That leaves 33 Democrats of 45 who have not signed on in the Senate. Not surprisingly, the Democrats in Congress who are not on board tend to be the ones who have taken and continue to accept campaign contributions from fossil fuel companies and privately owned utility companies. Politics is a team sport, and politics are the teams. And our political system is designed to limit the competition to two teams, the Republicans and the Democrats. There are a lot of people who don't like either one of these teams. I understand that. I also understand that unless and until we change the fundamental, the fundamental method we use in our elections, we are going to have a duopoly. And while I hope we move on to proportional representation and ranked choice voting, that is not likely to happen on a broad scale anytime soon, especially at the federal level. Politics is also a numbers game. It takes 218 votes in the House and somewhere between 50 and 60 in the Senate to pass legislation. If a president vetoes a bill, it takes 290 votes in the House and 67 in the Senate to override the veto. Once upon a time, members of both major parties would work together to reach those numbers on major pieces of legislation. Those halcyon days of bipartisanship are gone. Today, those numbers must be assembled within one of the two major parties. If the climate crisis is anywhere near the top of your list of concerns, the Republican Party is not an option. The Republican Party is a wholly owned subsidiary of corporate interest and the only major political party anywhere in the world that denies that global warming as even a cause for concern. That leaves the Democratic Party. A strong and united Democratic Party is our only hope for electing a Congress that will enact a Green New Deal. 
and as the numbers I mentioned with regard to co-sponsorship of the Green New Deal resolution indicate, the Democratic Party is far from united. The basis for unity within a political party is supposed to be the party platform, but we don't pay much attention to platforms anymore. I think we need to make platforms matter again, especially the Democratic Party platform. So much of politics is a dirty, nasty business. To paraphrase Shakespeare, a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. In the end, the only thing that makes that nasty business worthwhile is those rare occasions when legislation is passed that promotes the general welfare, that makes life better for some group of people that has been held back, held down, discriminated against, shortchanged, and or mistreated. And movements are often necessary to raise awareness to the level necessary to build support uh, for change to the point where uh, reform can no longer be denied. It is useful, however, to appreciate some sage advice from an unlikely source. The Wit and Wisdom of Chris Christie is a very slim volume. <laughs> this may be the entire book. Speaking to his fellow Republicans, after disparaging the ideas of Democrats, liberals, progressives, college students, and others with whom he disagrees, he said this, we have our ideas too. And if we want our ideas to matter, we have to win elections. Because if we don't win, we don't govern. And if we don't govern, all we do is shout into the wind. Now, those of you who know that I am also a singer-songwriter and I frequently uh, perform uh, sing-along type uh, uh, movement songs at events like yesterday uh, down at J.C. Nichols Park, uh, I don't shout into the wind as often as I sing into the wind. Uh, singing into the wind is more enjoyable, but equally ineffective. <laughs> the current Democratic Party platform is filled with good ideas, pragmatic proposals for addressing the problems we face as a nation. The legislation called for has the support of 60 to 80 percent of voters, including on average two-thirds of independent voters and half of Republican voters. If Democrats in Congress unite in support of our party platform, we will see independent voters and disaffected Republican voters move into the party. If we use that new majority to actually pass the legislation called for in our platform into law, it will usher in a brighter future for our country and for the world. Benjamin Franklin once observed that well done is better than well said. I encourage all of you who have not already done so to visit drawdown.org or get a copy of their book and take a look at the long list of things that can be done to uh, reverse global warming. Do the things you can. Take note of what things and how many things re require government action. There is one notable omission from the drawdown list. We need to make every election a climate crisis election. Spread the word. People who are struggling to make ends meet can be excused if the climate crisis is not at the top of their list of concerns. Those of us who have a more comfortable life must take the lead. We need to join forces and vote climate deniers out of office along with the members of Congress and state legislatures who profess a belief in climate science and a generalized exception, acceptance of the need to act, but who fail to act. Encourage your representatives in Congress, in state legislatures, and on city councils, Republicans and Democrats alike, to pass the legislation needed to make the vision of the Green New Deal resolution a reality and serve them notice that your vote is not for sale. And if their vote is for sale to any part of the fossil fuel industry, you will not vote for them or support them in any way. A quote from Aristotle is appropriate here. A politician, once elected, behaves as if they have a terminal illness and staying in office is all that will keep them alive. 
Right now, too many politicians believe that lots of big checks that come with strings attached is what they need to win elections. We need to convince them. We need to demonstrate. We need to make it clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that things have changed. Money will no longer get them elected or reelected. Money will not prevent us from voting them out of office. They need to vote for the legislation needed to make the Green New Deal happen or start looking for a new line of work. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was outspent 11 to 1 in her primary election, and she won. We need a lot more victories like that in 2020 and in elections beyond that. The Declaration of Independence famously says that governments are established to protect our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The final reason given in the preamble to our Constitution for establishing our government is to, quote, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, unquote. If we don't get serious about responding to the climate crisis, we will not even secure the blessings of civilization for future generations. And the pursuit of happiness will be replaced with the grim pursuit of enough food to stay alive. It is the movement in support of the Green New Deal that must grow to the point of being too big to fail. Failure is not an option. We are a partner with the Climate Council of Greater Kansas City, a technology hub for organizations supporting solutions for the climate crisis. This video is sponsored by the Heartland Renewable Energy Society, working to create a clean, safe, and renewable energy future.